Okay, so now we're going on to the next topic. Um, and that is uh, particle kinematics. That part isn't new, but now we're going to two dimensions. Um, and uh, we know that in 1D and 2D, um, <clears throat> most of the important quantities that we deal with are directional quantities. Uh, when you have values in those quantities, they tell you something about a direction as well as a magnitude. Um, so. We need directional quantities in 1D and 2D. Um, in 1D, so, you know, think about an object moving along a line. And let's say that the object is right here. Uh, the thing that characterizes 1D is that at any location, you only have two choices of where to go. Okay, so this particle can go this way or this way, and that's all of its choices. So if you choose a positive direction, one of those directions can be by your choice of the positive direction, one of those two directions is defined by positive and one's defined by negative. Um, so since there's only two possible directions, you can give the direction by assigning one way positive and one way negative. Okay, that works out perfectly. There's two signs and there's two directions in 1D. But now everything is gonna get screwed up in 2D. That's a nice system. In 2D, if you have a particle here, it can go this way or this way, or this way or this way, or anything in between any of those. Okay, so at any location, a particle has infinitely many choices of where to go. Um, And so obviously the positive negative sign isn't gonna give us a direction anymore. There's no way to specify um, infinitely many directions with only two signs. Um, so that won't work. In 2D, so we need something else. to specify directions. And um, the thing that uh, we're going to use to give directions in 2D uh, is called a vector. And so now before I get back into two-dimensional kinematics of particles, I have to spend, probably we'll get done today or close to the end of it today, but I'm gonna to spend today giving just bare bones definition of what we need for trigonometry and then using trigonometry to define vectors. And then those vectors are what we're gonna use for our calculations.
Okay, so that new thing is vectors. Um, and you can think of a vector as an arrow. in space um, with two properties. Um, so let's say this is a vector, okay? An arrow, this is what I mean. There's a, it's not just a line, it's, um, it, makes a distinction between one side, the side with the head, and the other side with the tail. Okay, so um, line doesn't make a distinction between this and this. This one is this way. So the two properties that this vector has are magnitude um, that's the length of the of the arrow and the second one is direction uh, that's the that's the way the arrow is pointing where the head of the arrow points And notice that, um, so notice, um, the number in one dimension had these same two exact properties. And these same two properties. Um, so, for example, um, if you have a velocity of negative six meters per second, yes. Yeah. Well, no, it's not a ray because, a, no, because the length of the arrow matters. So you'll have short ones and long ones, and those give the magnitude. Yes. Okay, so um, if you, in 1D, have a velocity of negative 6 meters per second, um, that means you have a magnitude of 6 meters per second. And it's pointed in the negative direction. Okay, so in 1D, um, you know, a number, so in other words, a number is really, you can think of it as a 1D vector. I didn't really think of it that, that way much, but it has the same two properties as a vector, and that's a fine way to think about it. Um, all of our directional quantities will be vectors in two dimensions. Um, so we're talking about position, displacement, velocity, and acceleration. And when we define something as a vector, when we have a quantity that's a vector, we're going to indicate that by putting an arrow over the top. That's a vector symbol. So position, displacement, velocity, and acceleration are all vector quantities.
notice they all have different units. Um, so the vector itself doesn't have its own units. The units depend on what kind of quantity it is. Just like in 1D, a number didn't have its own units. It depended what you're talking about, velocity or acceleration. Um, and uh, so this is It doesn't what? Yeah, it is. So the the vector, well, I suppose you could think of it as a vector number times units the same way as you think of like a number. Yeah. Um, yep. So we will, we'll, so like a, a velocity vector, we'll talk about it as like, components two negative four meters per second. It, so it does, it will have units the same way like a directional quantity in 1D had units. Um, okay, so let's look at this example here. Um, when we do calculations with vectors, we're gonna express them in component form. We're gonna talk about the components of a vector. And to come up with components, you need to first choose a coordinate system. Um, so once you choose a coordinate system, um, you can express the vector using components. So um, the way you can think of that is if this is the coordinate system, there's your x-axis and there's your y-axis, and this is the vector, we can break that up into, so if you think of, One that's parallel to the x-axis, and one that's parallel to the y-axis. Okay? And those two separate legs are going to be called the components. How far did you have to go in the x-direction? And did you have to go in the positive or negative x-direction? And then the same thing for y. Yep. Uh, no, not really. Not yet. But you can get slope information of the vector off of the component information. And we will talk about how to do that. So, um, so let's think about the components of this. Uh, so in order to get from the tail of this vector to its head, you go this far along the positive x direction. So we'll call this the x component. What? Uh, well, we're not going to use the rise... You can think of it as a rise and a run. We're not going to, we're not calculating the slope right now. You could. And then the second leg is like from here to here. And that's called the Y component. And you can see that uh, these two legs of the journey are always going to be perpendicular to each other. And so if you draw the vector and then you draw the two components like this, it's always going to make a right triangle. And that's why trigonometry is going to be important in this. So to calculate components, This is a set of steps that'll always work. Um, so 
for a vector with a length L. Capital L. Um, so the first thing you need to do is put the tail of the vector at the origin of the coordinate system where the X and Y axes meet. I'm going to talk about coordinate systems a lot, so I'm going to start abbreviating it just CS. Whenever I write CS, that's what I'm talking about. Um, then the next step is to determine the counterclockwise angle from the positive x-axis to the vector, and we're going to call that angle theta. Yeah, it has to be the positive side of the x-axis. I'll do a couple examples. Um, um, then the X component is L times the cosine of theta, and the Y component. is L times the sine of theta. Yep. And um, we're going to write this. Uh, so our component notation for vectors will be, so if this is the vector u that we're talking about, the variable is u and the arrow says that it's a vector variable, um, we're always going to put the x component on top, so L cosine theta. Underneath, we're going to put the y component, L sine theta, and uh, we're going to use square brackets around them. And notice it, that's not a fraction, so there's no bar between them. It's just a way of writing the two components. And it's kind of a complicated way to write it. So when I say that this is the X component, if we put it on top, we know that it's the X component. Right? Um, so this top one is always the X component. The bottom is the Y component. Um, and there are a lot of different ways, a lot of different notations for writing the components of vectors. This is the one we're going to use in this class. Um, but it doesn't change the meaning of any of this stuff to write it a different way. You can come up with your own where you, um, where you draw a monkey and then the X component sits on the monkey's head and it's holding the Y component. And that would be work just the same, you know. But this is the notation we're going to use. Um, So let me do an example. So uh, let's say that we have a vector that points this direction and it has a length of five. And let's say that this vector makes an angle with the vertical of 45 degrees. 
And we're going to calculate the components of this vector in two different coordinate systems. So the first one we're going to use is the standard coordinate system that I'm sure everyone is most used to working with. Um, and then after that, we're going to calculate the components of the same vector in a coordinate system oriented like this, where this is the x-axis. This is the y-axis, and um, there's an angle of 45 degrees between the vertical and the y-axis. Yeah. Um, although, if I didn't draw the, yeah, the negatives, like then if I just drew it like this, um, then I'll tell you later why you would know which one was X and which one was Y. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Um, okay, so magnitude's five. That's going to be our L. And for each of these, we just need to figure out um, the that angle theta. So let's do this first one. So the first one, our coordinate system looks like this. The first thing we do is draw our vector and the vector is fixed in space. We never, we don't rotate this vector. It, it is what it is, you know, it has its own identity. We wanna respect its identity. Um, so I'm gonna draw the vector in the same with the same length and the same orientation, but with its tail, the origin of this coordinate system. Okay, so there's the vector. And now you can tell if you look at how I defined the vector, it's an angle of 45 degrees with the vertical. And this coordinate system has the y-axis on the vertical. So we know that this angle between the y and the vector is 45 degrees. Okay. And so now what we have to do is figure out that angle theta. And to figure out the theta, we start with the positive x-axis and figure out how far we have to rotate counterclockwise around the end of the vector. So we're going to start like this. If we rotate 90 degrees, we're like this. Yep, and then 45 degrees more, and we're at 135. So theta for this is 135 degrees. Um, and so then... The components of this vector, I'll call it u again, are equal to, so for the x component, it's going to be the length of the vector, 5, times the cosine of 135 degrees. So 5 times cosine of 135. And the y component is going to be 5 times the sine of 135 degrees. Be sure you have your calculator set in degrees. Our angles are all going to be in degrees in this class. Um, yes, because no, this is it. cosine is the x. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, so if you plug that in and you have your calculator set in degrees, this will give you negative 3.535. Positive 3.535. And what that says 
is, so those, that's the X and the Y component. So that says to get from the tail of the vector to the head of the vector, you first go along the X axis, along the negative says you go along in the negative direction. You go a distance of 3.535 along the negative X. And then you're there. And from there you go in the positive Y direction, another 3.535. Okay, so in that first coordinate system, these are the components. Now let's do it for the second coordinate system. Anybody have any questions about that yet? Yes. Um, all, really, the only thing you're going to have to do in problems is just come up with the components. I'm just trying to sort of keep illustrating what it is because it's sort of a new concept. Um, but that's what the negative there means. Um, if that was positive, then to get from the tail of the head means we would go that far in this direction before we went out. So you get a different vector. <laughs> um, so the new coordinate system is like this. There's the x-axis, there's the y-axis, and we know that it's a 45 degree angle from the vertical to the y-axis. So in this coordinate system, where does the vector go? So remember, we don't change the orientation of the vector, we just sort of overlay, think of overlaying the vector picture you have on top of the coordinate system. Yeah, so the tail goes at the origin, and now, uh, the only way to interpret this is that the tail is at the origin and the vector lies right on top of the y-axis. Um, okay, so first let's do it. Um, yeah, that was just the coordinate system I chose. We could have lined it up so they were a little different or whatever, but that's the way I chose it. Um, so let's first do it with that angle theta. Okay. Um, so remember, to get that angle theta, you have to start on the positive x axis, and then you have to rotate counterclockwise from that to the vector. So what's the angle you have to go starting at this x-axis to get to the vector? Yep, 90. So theta is equal to 90 degrees. And so that means that the vector components are five times the cosine of 90 degrees. That's the x component five times sine of 90 degrees, that's the y component, and that just gives you zero, five, because the cosine of 90 is zero. Okay, so the reason I did this one where the vector lays right on top of the y-axis is that whenever you have a vector that lies right on top of either the positive or the negative axes, you can just, you don't have to calculate that. You can just go straight to the vector because if, um, if you're trying to come up with a path that goes from the origin to, to some point along the y-axis, okay, you can't go anywhere along x and then go y to get there. The only way you can get there is, in this case, 
start here, skip the part of going along x, and then just head out along y. So if you know the length of the vector, in this case it's five, you're just gonna you're just gonna go five in the direction of that axis. And if instead that vector went along the negative y, it would be zero for the x component, negative five for the y component. Okay. So any of these four axes, if you have a vector that along x, along y, along negative x, along negative y, you can just go straight to writing that down. That's, you know, L0 or negative L0 or 0L or 0 negative L. Yeah, yeah, I could have chosen a different coordinate system for that where this was along the negative x axis, just like rotated 90 more degrees and then, or 90 degrees that way. And yeah, yep. Okay, so now here are some things to notice about this. Some things to keep in mind. First, we've seen something like this before, and it might not be totally obvious the the connection uh, on your own, but um, this choice of coordinate system so choosing the orientation of the coordinate system. is the two-dimensional equivalent of choosing the positive direction. Okay, so um, where we used to have to choose the positive direction and then that specified the negative direction and then we could assign numbers to things, uh, now we have to choose an orientation of the coordinate system. And there are going to be times, you know, the majority of the problems we do are going to just use the, normally the standard coordinate system. Uh, but there are going to be problems we do that are going to be easier if we use a funky rotation of the coordinate system. So we're going to do it sometimes. Yes. Yeah, however you want. Um, the, the only rule, and I'll get this in your notes later on, but the only rule is you can't flip it. So we're going to keep it. So anywhere you can, if you start with the standard one, anywhere you can rotate it is fine as long as you don't do this and then rotate it. Um, and the second uh, thing to notice is um, the components of a vector or let's say finding the components of a vector is exactly the same thing as finding the coordinates of the head of the vector Um, when the tail is at the origin. <clears throat> and uh, one way that's useful is you can use that to sanity check your answers. Um, because once you draw your coordinate system, however it's oriented, this is the first quadrant, this is the second quadrant, this is the third, and this is the fourth. And notice that, um, you know, you know what the signs are of the coordinates of any point in this quadrant, and you know what they are in, in any one of them. 
And so if you have a vector that if you put it at the origin, it would origin, it would point into the first quadrant. Um, what sign does the X component have? Positive. And what sign does the Y component have? Good. And in the second quadrant, X, negative, Y, positive. Third, X, both negative, yep. And then the fourth, X, positive, and negative. And so if you think of putting the tail of the vector at the origin, then depending on which quadrant the vector points into, those are gonna be the signs of the components. Most likely if you do a calculation and the signs of your components don't match the signs that you should have according to this, uh, your calculator is in radians and you need to switch to degrees. That's the most likely thing that would go wrong. Any questions about that? Um, okay, so that's how we calculate components. Um, so once you have your vector expressed in component form, there are three types of calculations that are going to be useful to us. First one is adding two vectors. The second one is multiplying a vector by a number. And uh, when you're talking about a number as opposed to a vector, that's called a scalar. So I'm sure I'll say that by accident some. So that's what it means. When I say by a vector, by a scalar, it just means one thing is a vector, one thing is just a number, and you're multiplying them together. And then um, the third thing is calculating the magnitude of the vector. So um, the first one, adding two vectors. So if you're adding one vector that has components A, B to another vector that has components C, D, the sum of those two vectors has a x component that's equal to the sum of the x components and a y component that's equal to the sum of the y components. Um, and that has a physical meaning to a graphical meaning that you can imagine. We'll talk about this uh, graphical meaning more in lab. Um, but this is how we do the calculations. But I'm going to call this a physical meaning. 
of adding two vectors um, so the first step is put the vectors head to tail And then the sum, or it's called the resultant, has its tail at the free tail. I'll show a picture of what I mean. And its head at the free head. Okay, so uh, for example, if you're adding um, this vector plus this vector, you put the tail of one at the head of the other one, and it doesn't matter what order you choose. Okay, so I imagine taking this one and moving it over here so the tail is at the head of this one. Any questions about what I did there? I could have done it in the other order too, it doesn't matter. You get the same answer either way. Tail to head. As put the vectors head to tail. And then this, okay, so all I've done so far is put the vectors head to tail. I haven't done the second part yet. And then the, the resultant vector goes from so the free tail and the free head. Like this tail and this head are touching, so they're not free. But this is the free tail, this is the free head. So the resultant vector goes from here to here. So if this is like, if you call this U1 and this is U2, then this one is the sum, U1 plus U2. Um, and it turns out that this simple way of doing the math works exactly like if you really carefully took measurements of the length of these vectors and measured the angles with protractors and did this thing and then measured the angle of the result with a protractor and a ruler. You get the same thing doing this as you do with this. But this is the way we're gonna use for calculations, but this is the way to kind of imagine how it works. So let me, let me show how that works with a example. So let's say we have um, the vector five, negative five. And the vector zero, four. So to add them, you take five plus zero, that gives you five for the X component. Negative five plus four gives you negative one for the y component. And so that's the sum of those vectors. That's the resultant vector. Now, uh, let's think about the directions of these vectors and do this addition graphically and see, uh, see if we can, you know, hopefully if we do it carefully enough, it'll, you know, we'll be able to convince ourselves that it's the same thing. Okay, so let's use this coordinate system. Um, so first, this vector five, negative five. 
Um, that's so one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Um, this five negative five, we go in the positive x direction five, then the negative y direction five, and so we're right at this point here, and that's lo the location of the head of the vector when the tail is at the origin. Our first vector looks like that. And then our second vector goes one, two, three, four, um, goes zero in the x direction, four in the positive y direction, so it's right here. That's the head, so we're adding these two. Um, and so now if I uh, add those two sort of carefully. So we have that one. Uh, and we put the tail of the second one at the head of this one. And then the resultant goes from the free tail to the free head. We get something like that. And now if we think about the components of that one, draw this over here. then that vector would be, um, you go five in the positive x direction and one in the negative y direction. And that matches the answer we got here. Okay. So those are the same thing, those two ways of doing it. It's not really that surprising. I I sort of drew the picture to make it work. But, but yeah, if you did it really carefully with a protractor and stuff, it would work out in that. Yeah, that would have been a good idea. I wouldn't have had to draw so many pictures. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, okay. So that was, yes. Uh, you'll you'll do problems where um, you'll be given that something happens at 30 degrees above the horizontal, and you have to use that fact to calculate vector components that'll then go into the calculations. Okay, the second kind of calculation we're going to do is multiplying a vector by a scalar. by a number. Um, and mathematically, when you do it in components, that as an, like adding, that as a, it's an easy calculation. So if you have a vector AB and you want to multiply it by the number C, you do that by, uh, so the X component is going to be the number times the X component. So that'll be C times A. And the Y component will be the number times the Y component. So that's CB. That also has a physical meaning that's pretty easy to uh, wrap your head around. So the physical meaning 
we're going to think of it in two parts. So the first one is if you to multiply a vector by a positive number. Um, so what you do is keep the vector in the same direction. Keep vector in the same direction. And multiply its length by the number. Its magnitude is multiplied by the number. Okay, so for example, um, if you're multiplying two times the vector, so let's say the vector we want to multiply is this. And the way you do that is you keep the direction the same and you multiply the length by two and then that will be the, the output vector. Um, that, that way of thinking about it, it's for positive numbers. So the other thing we need is we need to know how to multiply by negative one. So to multiply a vector by negative one, keep the length of the vector the same. and just switch the head and the tail. So for example, um, negative one times this vector is this vector. And so now, with those two things, you, in two steps, you can do multiply by any number. Like if you want to multiply by negative 40, you first keep the length the same and multiply, the, keep the direction the same and multiply the length by 40. And then when you're done with that and you have this long thing, then you just switch the head and the tail to make it negative. Well, yeah, I mean, when when we're doing this physical stuff, um, so I guess the key thing to remember is that um, we put the tail of vectors at the origin in order to visualize certain things. And um, but a vector doesn't have a position; it only has two properties. It only has a magnitude, a length, and a direction. And so you can move vectors around in space. Um, we, um, so when you're talking about an individual vector, it doesn't matter if it's heads at the origin or whatever, or tails at the origin or whatever. It's, you move it over so the tails at the origin to do certain calculations. So I think that's probably a fine way to think about it, but yeah. Um, okay, and let's, let me do an example. Uh, of a calculation. So if you want to multiply um, 8 times the vector, negative 4, positive 6, then the x component you get out of that is going to be 8 times negative 4, so negative 32. And the y component is going to be 8 times 6, so 48. 
And if you had this vector's tail at the origin, uh, what quadrant would its head be in? Two, that's right. Because uh, you have a negative X component and a positive Y component. And if you multiply this now by negative one, which, uh, which quadrant would it be in? Four, it would just switch to the opposite direction. Um, but mathematically, you can just think the, um, the X component would be positive, the Y component would be negative, so that's the fourth quadrant. Yep. I think that's a nice way to think about it, yeah. Oh. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, think about it as, as coordinates. Uh, I mean, really coordinates are, what coordinates are is the vector from the origin to the location. So uh, there's really no distinction between coordinates and components. You've just, you're just used to talking about coordinates and you haven't done calculations with vectors yet. That's the only difference. Uh, this is in the second quadrant. And if you multiply that by negative something, it would be in the fourth quadrant. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so that, that's what multiplying by a negative one always does reflect across the origin. Yeah, not a, it's just reflected straight through the, the origin, not about the x-axis, you know what I mean? But I think you're thinking, I, I think you're thinking about it right. Any other questions? Okay, there's one more calculation that we're gonna do. Calculating the magnitude of a vector. So sometimes you, so sometimes you have the magnitude and an angle and you have to turn it into components to do calculations. Other times you have components and you need to figure out the magnitude. It's just nice to be able to go back and forth. Um, so to calculate the vector magnitude, uh, so if your vector u has an x component of a and a y component of b, Then the magnitude of the vector, which you write as the absolute value. So the absolute value symbol for a vector means the length or the magnitude. Is equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. Um, that formula probably looks familiar. Can, can you place where that formula is from? Pythagorean theorem, yep, and and it's not just a coincidence. It really is the Pythagorean theorem that we're talking about here because if if you want to know the length of this vector, given that its components are a and b, That's a right triangle, and um, the length of the vector itself then is this. Okay, there's only one more thing I want to say. Uh, well, let me do a calculation. Um, Okay, so let's say that our vector u is uh, where was that? Okay, so let's say that our vector u is negative three point 
5.35, positive 3.535. What's the magnitude of that vector? So that would be, so square negative 3.535, the negative goes away when you do that, and add that to the y component squared, and take the square root. All right. And the reason I did those numbers was because the first example we did started with a vector with a magnitude of 5 somewhere here. It had a magnitude of 5. We went through those steps to calculate its components. So when we use those components to recalculate the magnitude, it needs to give back the original value. And, and so it does, it gives back five. Yep. Uh, yeah, it'll, so these will come to you, uh, be given to you in different ways. I mean, sometimes you'll be given some of the components uh, sometimes you'll be given a magnitude and a direction. Um, and the physics part of it, or some of the physics part of it, so that's kind of the math part that we're talking about right now, but the physics part is knowing how to interpret the physical information and turn that into vector stuff that you can do calculations with. So it won't really, it won't say this is a component or this is the magnitude. It'll say like, for example, a ball shot at a speed of whatever, at an angle of whatever, and you need to know how that relates to the velocity vector. Well, you'll always either know something about the components or you'll have the angle, yeah. I mean, you'll always have enough information to solve it, but how you... Nope, we're not going to use any inverse stuff. Nope. last thing I want to say is, so uh, we talked about the fact that these components are dependent on what coordinate system you use, but not any two um, perpendicular vectors are an allowable coordinate system for us. So the question is, uh, what coordinate systems are allowed? Um, and the answer is uh, you can use any coordinate system. So start with that standard coordinate system that you're used to. And you can rotate it. but don't flip it. So like, for example, here, so this is allowed. This is allowed. But this isn't, and this isn't. Because both of these, if you start, so if my thumb is the x-axis and my first finger is the y-axis, you can start in that standard orientation and rotate it to get that. And this one you can do if you're really flexible. 
and that's still just a rotation. But there's no way to start like this and rotate it to get this unless you flip it. Same with this one. So the top one is the red. So is the first quadrant of that then still between the Y and the Yeah. Yeah, so this is yes. So uh this is still the first quadrant, second quadrant, third and fourth. Yep, that's right. Yep. Yep, the first is the one that's sort of defined there. Yep, counterclockwise from there, yep. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so there will be, I can, right off the top of my head, I can only think of one time that we're going to use that. Uh, but if you have problems uh, where something is rolling or sliding along a surface, um, it turns out that the calculations are easier if you align your coordinate system to the incline. So you have your x-axis along the incline and your y-axis up. It makes the calculations a lot easier. And so the short answer is, We'll rotate the coordinate system when the calculations get easier if we do it. But that might be the only case. Any other questions? Okay, have a good weekend. If you have classes tomorrow, uh, go to those classes first and then have a good weekend. <laughs>